Hello everyone! We are going to talk about still life today and I want you to first look at this still life artwork and list all the, all the things you see in the painting. So pause the video, make yourself a little list, and then we will talk about it. So pause right now. Pause. All right. So hopefully you paused and made yourself a little list. So let's talk about what you maybe saw in this still life. So first thing I see is the hourglass. Then I see a skull. And on the skull is this greenery halo crown thing. I see the flowers. I see this mirror. There's, of course, a stack of books, this letter, letter or document. It might be even be money, I'm not sure. Um, there's a portrait here. I think this is a compass, maybe a watch. Um, I'm not too sure what all this shenanigan is. Um, this thing here you may not be able to see. We always um, debate whether it's a snake or a rope or not. Um, then you have a candlestick up here. You very weirdly have bubbles. Where do bubbles come from? And then you have this sketch back here and it looks like someone is praying to a cross but then something else is happening over here. Oh, did I say flowers? There's flowers too. So there's a lot going on here. Hopefully you got some of what I listed off. What we are going to talk about is just a little bit of history of still life. So still life is an arrangement of inanimate objects depicted in an artwork. So an arrangement of inanimate objects depicted in an artwork. Now, I'm not making you take notes, but you will have a final exam at the end of the semester. And this definition is on the exam. Okay. Traditionally, still life subject matters are flowers, kitchen utensils, food, other household objects arranged on a table. And as an art geek, I love looking at still lifes because some of these items, like who has a picture like this in their house nowadays? But centuries ago, hundreds, hundreds of years ago, this is what someone was using, which I think is pretty cool. Now, a contemporary example of a still life is something made within the last 20 years, which is 2000 to 2020, which is crazy to me. Um, but here you can see the contemporary items, a lot of plastic things. Um, let's see here. So you have the mustard bottle, 409. There's a corkscrew. There's still fruit, just like in the older version which I find interesting as well. So as you go through my little still life PowerPoint here, you might notice similar items. So there's a feather here. There is a skull, some books, some glassware. Still life is a work of art, drawing or painting, usually of a group of objects. These objects do not move, hence the word still. Objects tend to be flowers, fruit, and other kinds of food, or dead animals, hence life. What is a still life's orientation? Where did it come from? Well, it all started um, with a direct translation of the Dutch word still even, which was used from 1656 to describe paintings previously called fruit or flower pieces. So here you have a nice still life with all the fruit and then there's a drink and a glass over here. Here is what I would think would be the start of dinner. So you have your pheasant and your rabbit for dinner. This is the pot it will go in. Your fruits to help with flavor. And then I like how this artist um, put the live cat near it as he's watching. It could be a whole narrative about, oh, am I next? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they don't eat cats. All right, so disclaimer. When we look at art history, 
Historical subject matters are often based on religious beliefs. The church was the most important thing historically centuries ago. So we often see biblical characters, Christian, Hebrew, like all different Muslim characters, all based on the religion of the area in the artworks. There were no pop stars back then. People really idolized religious figures. Okay. So still life started with Egyptians really documenting their offerings to their gods. So this is on a wall, kind of like, um, I don't want to say cave painting, but sort of kind of similar. And there's a variety of different offerings to their gods. So there's a basket of figs right here. I've never had a fig. I should try one. There's grapes, bread. This is a leg of beef here. You can see the hooves. A duck, more meat, and a cucumber. I think this is the cucumber. So you can see, like, their proportions are just not correct. Um, but this was a big feast. I think this is squash up here. A big feast for the gods. So they're documenting what they're offering to their religious figures. And I pretty much just explained that. All right, so then we go to the Greek and Romans. So we have, as a humanity, we have grown a little bit. And you can see here, um, the Greek and Romans were a lot more realistic with their depiction of still lifes. There's more um, accurate shading and coloring than the Egyptians had. So here I feel like on the left, the Egyptians is very much just a flat documenting, trying to make something look similar to what they're putting in their basket for their gods. And then on the right, you can tell that this is on a step. There's value on this fruit. Um, you can tell with the glass that there's a front and a back and there's inside. So it's a lot more um, developed artistically. So then we keep evolving and now we're in the 16th and 17th century. So serious still life painting only took off in the, around the 1500s in Northern Europe. During the Middle Ages, art was supposed to serve Christianity, illustrating scenes from the Bible. So this is a scene from the Bible, but you can see here there is still a still life on the table, which is really their food, their dinner. Um, I want you to start to mentally accept that we're talking the 16th and 17th century. Majority of people cannot read. So the way they are able to see a story, understand a story, is through paintings that the church commissioned. And <clears throat> the stories that are often repeated and told over and over again are religious-based stories. So you can see here the still life. Then another purpose for artists historically was to do portraits, and they would use still lifes like this example to help portray what the person was about. So here you have a globe and some musical instruments. These look like inventions. So these two must have been, um, it says the ambassadors. They must have been part of some sort of exploratory studies back then. So during this time, um, artists tried to create dramatic scenes in a very realistic style. So if you go two slides back, the still life on the story from the Bible um, looked really nice and it looked like a great dinner. This still life looks like they got halfway through it, they took a bite out of their biscuit, they barely had any, I don't know what you need a lemon for, um, something's been knocked over, pulled off, so something happened with this still life. And if you're just a normal person walking past it in the art gallery, you may not stop and think about it. But having um, a disheveled scene like this is telling an additional story. <clears throat> so this highly skilled painters in the 1400s and 1500s, such as Van Eyck here, included arrangements of objects as part of their Christian scenes. So um, there's different things around here. It's like multiple still lifes. But they're starting to put objects in to the scenes to um, to symbolize specific 
emotions or aspects of the story. But you can see here from the Greek and Roman still life to this one here on the left, how much, especially if you just look at the glass, our brains of humans have evolved and the techniques and skills that we have acquired and learned over the years as a species, we've really um, grown, grown quite a bit. So um, I call them vanitas. I heard somebody else recently call them um, bonitas. So I say vanitas. But these are paintings of materialistic objects that hold a special meaning. Vanitas are really cool, I think. Um, the name refers to a passage of the Bible in Revelation, which says vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The idea was that people love their pleasures in life, the things that make them feel important or wealthy, and yet it all means nothing because time soon passes. Although perhaps it's true that we shouldn't get too attached to our possessions. Let's talk about that. Don't we all hoard certain things and keep certain items because they have a special meaning to us? And then there's that phrase, take a picture, it'll last longer. That's kind of what vanities are, okay? So here's a cool one. You still have the repeating skull. You still have the repeating glassware and containers that people are using to hold things. You still have a book. There's a clock here and flowers. Um, so there are repeating objects throughout all still life. Common Vanita symbols include skulls which are a reminder of life certainties. So unfortunately, we will all pass away one day and our skull will be remained. Rotten fruit symbolizes decay, like aging and getting older. Bubbles are in um, a lot of still lives or vanitas, vanities, no, not vanity, vanitas, which symbolize the brevity of life. So brevity, I had to look up what it meant, but it meant the quickness and how fleeting and how in a moment a life can be gone. So bubbles, they don't last very long, similar to life. An hourglass symbolizes time passing. Fruits, vegetables, sometimes there's butterflies in a still life, um, can be interpreted for the same way. I didn't know this, but a peeled lemon can often symbolize the bitterness of life. Here are other examples of still life. I have to talk quickly. I only have a couple minutes left. And this is, um, we've jumped several centuries here. Now we're into Impressionist and Post-Impressionist. So um, in terms of science, we have actually, um, we have new colors now. We've invented new colors and things are brighter during the Impressionist time. See, brighter. But we still have skulls and fruits and flowers. Keep going and going. Then we get to a world of cubism. So people have definitely conquered the still life. They understand what it's about. Now they're conceptually trying to change what that means by breaking them apart, putting them in different places, trying to engage the viewer more. So here are just some examples. This is Cubist work. Pablo Picasso. Then you get to pop art, which kind of brought still life back. Um, artists use still life a lot to practice their technique and to kind of document whatever's around them. So um, these are really cool pieces by Lichtenstein. And his whole thing was to kind of um, enlarge what a printing press can do, but to do it on a painting. So here's, again, that contemporary still life. Now, I found this artist recently. He's a contemporary artist, and so he does these traditional, or he, he can find still, uh, thrift store paintings, but then he adds in 21st century items. So here's your McDonald's chicken nuggets and waffles. You can see here, this is one of his paintings. He put the Clorox wipes. I thought that was very timely. This is also another artist. I found her on Instagram, but I just love her stuff. And she does such cool still lifes with um, things from my childhood, maybe yours too, 
like the bubble gum and the goldfish and this cute little lizard stuff lizard thing and that candy you can get at the store and these old school Nintendo controllers.